Fire Call, the Fire Safety Show with Division Chief Jim Sedaris. Hi, my name is Division Chief Jim Sedaris, and you are watching Fire Call. Hey, we're going to take you back behind the scenes of Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, and this show is just going to be rescue-licious. We got trench rescue. We're sitting in a major hazmat scene here. We got all kinds of stuff going on. So sit back, tell the kids to be quiet, grab some food to eat, spend some time with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, and we're gonna get to some shout outs and answer some of those questions that you're gonna have. Now we're getting these shout outs from all over the country, including foreign countries. So if you wanna get your shout out, if you wanna ask your question, Wait till the end of the show and we'll show you our website. You can go on, type in your question, and if we answer your question, we'll send you a super secret surprise. Our first shout out is from Great Falls, Montana. He wants a shout out. He wants two shout outs. He wants a shout out to Great Falls Fire Rescue and also a shout out to one of our firefighters, Kurt Rangal, who's from up around uh, Great Falls. This uh, next shout out is from California. Matthew lives in San Jose, California. He wants a shout out to San Jose Fire. So this one's going out to all the men and women of San Jose Fire. Our last shout out before we get to the questions is gonna be from John. John lives in New Market, Indiana. He wants a shout out to the guys of New Market Fire Department and Southwest Rescue Services. So I hope, uh, I hope you're watching so you get your shout out. Now we got a bunch of stuff going on today and it's just been kind of, this show is just kind of chaotic running around. So we're gonna jump out and see what's going on and uh, take you back behind the scenes of Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. In this world of WMDs and terrorism, everybody, and I mean every department, has to be concerned about being ready to handle a weapons of mass destruction. Even in South Dakota, middle of the heartland, we gotta be prepped up. So we're doing a pretty big drill here. We're just starting off. We've got Sioux Falls Fire, we got PD, and we also have teams from the Army in, so that if it were to be a WMD, that they can come in with their support teams and work with us to make sure everything glow, goes like clockwork. These are major incidents that happen, and you don't want to start trying to learn this stuff the day it happens. You want to be practicing and well prepared. So, we've got, we're starting just starting to set up a drill here, and you can see we got a lot of stuff going on. And we're going to go down and jump down and talk to some of the major players and figure out just how the Army interacts with the fire department. Rolling. And you can see now the operation is finally starting to get underway with people in suits and they're doing, uh, doing some work down here, a lot of strenuous work. And I'm going to introduce you to Captain Murphy. Captain Murphy is with the Army National Guard and you're with a very special team. And could you just kind of tell our viewers what actually are you, uh, the unit you're with, and what's the importance of the unit? Absolutely, Jim. I'm with the 82nd Civil Support Team. We're a WMD, or a terrorist response type mm -hmm. unit. Um, today, as you see behind you, we're doing a joint mission with the Sioux Falls Fire Department and Hazmat Team. And what we're doing is basically training for any pot potential future type operations that may occur in the future. Now, do you go anywhere in the state? Uh, do you have a region that you travel to? We do have a region. Uh, we can respond anywhere in the state um, and that's exactly why we're here today to forge relationships with folks all around the state. Because you um, are, so, so our viewers are, you are way on the other side of the state so this is a nice nice operation we can work together. That's correct, yes. We come from Rapid City. Uh, it takes about five and a half, six hours of driving with our vehicles uh, once, once called out and um, now we set up, we set up our operations and we're doing a joint mission to, uh, to see what's going on in this building. We've got some intel that says there's some bad stuff in the basement. Mm -hmm. um, someone came out with blisters on their hands and face and we want to try to find out what it is that caused that. And you have all that capability of doing this and even more. That's correct. Okay, let's take a look at some of the other stuff that you brought with you. Wonderful, thank you. In past episodes of Fire Call, you've seen how Sioux Falls Fire Rescue does decon. Well, this is a new way of doing it, and this is what the Army is using. It's a much more sophisticated program, uh, a lot of neat equipment. Captain Murphy, kind of talk about some of this equipment. This is a little more, right. so, much more sophisticated than what normal fire departments probably have available to them. Yeah, the, the unique thing about this is we have our decon line separated in two separate uh, units. 
the one you see in front of you, that you see the slide. This slide's for an emergency type situation. So you Say, plop someone down and run them right through a conveyor correct. belt. Right. If if there's one of the guys that are downrange down in that building and they they become contaminated or uh, incapacitated, we can run them through here and get them through quickly. The other part, or the personal or uh, regular, what we call regular decon, is after they're done with their mission, downrange mission, they come through and scrub their hands, their feet, and they get washed down by decon personnel to make sure that there are no contaminants that could affect the people in the cold zone or the, the area that's not contaminated. Sure. And then once we transport them, they're fairly clean, so we don't have to worry about deconning hospitals and some of those issues. That's correct. Now, this is kind of cool. This whole rubberized this whole rubberized system you got basically contains all the runoff, so you know we don't have to worry about it getting in sewer systems, septic systems. Uh, when this starts to fill up, then you drain it and tanker it out, basically. That's correct. We have uh, containers uh, and pumps that that are in here. So as we contain the the contaminant or potential contaminant, we can take it off site and uh, and not contaminate landfills or the the water or drinking supply in the community i, I want to see some of the other equipment you have here too okay let's go take a look now when you someone's decon some of the other things you talked about doing is uh, you have your own lab what tell me about the lab the lab that we have is called the alls what we call the analytical lab okay and we have two operators that you can see here, uh, Captain Star uh, is the, the main operator. She is the, the NIMSO or the Nuclear Med Science Officer. She's the one that, that runs the lab. Mm -hmm. From the information and things that they gather downrange, they take that um, through decon and process that chemical or agent or compound through so this lab. With this incident, we had one of our firefighters uh, got the substance on his glove. They would take that all the way up to here and be able to analyze what was on the glove. That's correct. Wow. They could they could double bag that, uh, put it in an overpack, bring it here in a safe environment. Uh, you also see Sergeant Kelly Crane works uh, in the lab as well, and they have the tools, and a glove box, to safely uh, analyze to see what is going on. That is amazing. Now you brought a ton of gear with you. What's this particular trailer do? This trailer here is actually used uh, for the survey folks. My survey folks being the people going out picking up the samples. That's correct. Okay. The ones that are going down range. As you see, the, the gentleman in the hat is our recon NCO. He's the one. He the looks only sassy one. too, doesn't he? Oh, he is. He's sassy. Sergeant First Class Mike Weirich. He's the one that's talking with the folks down range, the only one, to make sure that there isn't a lot of traffic on the down range channel. He's making sure that they're being safe. He knows exactly where they are at that. That board that you see there is actually the blueprint that uh, was drawn up, so he knows exactly where they're at at all times. Okay, great. Now, is he hardwired into them, or are they radio? It's radio. Okay. Yeah, it's all secure radio. What you see next to us here is actually the operations center, or the talk. That's where all information flows for the incident through this vehicle here, this trailer. And as you can see here, that's the operations officer. He's the one that uh, is in charge of this area and making sure that uh, he, he gets all the information so he knows exactly what's going on for the commander and uh, knows exactly at all times what's happening in the incident. So this is much like our command post. You have your own command post and then our two talk to each other. That's correct. One of the last trucks we're going to take a look at is a communications truck. Now, Captain Murphy said we got to be careful. He said if we if we said anything confidential, Sergeant Todd's going to kill us. So we have to be really cautious about this one. Now, what what does this do? You got a big satellite link up hookup? Is this what to see the internet? What are we doing? Well, there's a lot of things that are happening here. Uh, this is one of the most important pieces of equipment that we have on the team because without this, the operation doesn't happen. Uh, so I don't murder it. I want to make sure. Uh, Todd can explain this, so I'll, I'll pass off the question, and uh, he can explain sure. kind of what's going on here. Hey, directly behind me, there's a two and a half meter satellite dish that we set up when we arrive on scene, and through a military satellite, we're able to uh, get phone lines and internet connectivity. Um, so we, you could you can go anywhere in the U.S. and 
your on phone lines automatically exactly. and internet service? Exactly. I was just joking. I didn't know you could really do that. I actually used uh, 14 of these trucks down at Hurricane Katrina when all the cell towers and the trunking system went down. And this is what kind of gave the ICs and the different parishes a, a link out. We usually, on an incident, we usually run about 15 to 20 laptops and we can get four phone lines pushed out of this truck here. Sir, because uh, I know they said you could just drop off a laptop to us in our command post, and those are all hooked up wirelessly on scene? Yes. We can do either wireless or we can do a hard hard cable with the Cat5 cable running. You see a lot of cables running all sure. over here. So. Now, I know someone's going to ask me this question, so I'm going to ask you right now. How do you find the satellite when you're sitting out in the middle of South Dakota? There's a little black box sitting right there, and that's got squiggly lines on it. I had to go to school for about... Oh, 120 hours to learn how to read squiggly lines so I can stick <laughs> like the right satellites out. When you're scanning, when you're scanning across the sky, there's numerous satellites and there's a footprint of squiggly lines that uh, we know, memorize that we know that's our bird. So you're you're actually hooking up to one specific satellite, following us as we orbit around the sun, essentially. Exactly. Exactly. That is way cool. Exactly. Now. You also got this thing bordered off. What's with that? Is that for security or is that for safety? It's for safety. There's uh, about a 40 foot, 30 to 40 foot uh, safety barrier zone in front from RF radiation. Um, oh, that's nice. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> if you're planning on have kid, planning <laughs> on having kids, stay away from the front of the dish. Oh, okay. I know so we were getting all kinds of wild radio stations when we were in front. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Sergeant Todd. You bet. You bet. Well, Captain Murphy, I really want to thank you for coming out and bringing your team and talking to us. These kind of events really show the importance of that seamlessly integrated system involving military and also the public service fire departments. And I, I, we really appreciate what you do for us. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. I know it's a great opportunity for both the 82nd and the Sioux Falls fire folks to work together because you don't want this the first time to be the, the, the last time we operate together, especially when an incident like this, if it were real world, uh, it, it's nice to know who you're working with and to know their names by name, and it just makes this, the operation go that much smoother. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Now let's cut out to, out of here and on to our next story. This next question comes from Jamie, and Jamie lives in Nova Scotia, Canada. Jamie wants to know, what's one of the most useful pieces of equipment we have? Well, that question can go a lot of different ways, Jamie. If we're talking about fires, if we're talking about extrication, if we're talking about trench rescue. Today we're talking about trench rescue, and the crews from Sioux Falls Fire Rescue are practicing trench rescue. This is a very dangerous activity when it happens because things can go wrong. They train a lot for this. It's a complicated task, and we have one of the best trench rescue trainers in the country, bar none, Travis Tom. Trav, how you doing? Good. Okay, here's the word. Give us some insight on some of the most useful pieces of equipment. We start first, before we just start talking about equipment, give us a background on, on trench rescue. When something happens, is this a common thing that can happen? What causes these trenches to cave in? Just depends on uh, the ground soil right now in Sioux Falls. We're, uh, we're a wet soil right now. Wet, wet. What's that mean? Well, right now we've had a lot of rain, so our soil is very heavy in the top. Parts. If trenches have been open for a while now, we can be looking at sloughs or cave-ins. So they'll just actually just cave in on someone? Actually, one of our training trenches we dug uh, earlier this week has actually sloughed on us. We uh, actually shored that this morning. So when these cave in, is it a gradual thing or just all of a sudden it just the, the walls just come in and catch these workers unexpected? unexpectedly? Yeah, mostly unexpectedly. Um, if you're watching the soil, it will give you a few signs, but when it happens, it's very quickly. And once they're down, it's not like we're going to be able to just to jump down in this hole and yank them out. No, well the first thing we want to we want to preach to our guys is taking care of ourselves and making the trench safe for us to enter. Okay. Uh, what, and that's what we're doing right here. Is so, uh, the, making... so now useful pieces of equipment. That's what Jamie wants to know about. What are the key, key pieces of equipment that we have to have with these trench rescues to make them safe? Well right now what we're using is uh, we're using a strong back which is just a couple pieces of plywood so the big red squares of plywood are strong backs. Yeah, a, a fancy name for a strong, or a couple pieces of plywood is a strong back. Okay. With a 2 by 10 hook to it. And all that is is actually just occupying space behind the trench. And we're, what we're doing is trying to transfer the load from one side of the trench to the other. Okay. Through our strong backs and our struts. On this trench here, we're using uh, air struts, but we also can make them out of wood. 
Now, air struts, another useful piece of equipment for Jamie. Yep. How do the air struts work, and what uh, do they do? These are the ones we're using today are a Paratech pneumatic air strut. They, all they use is uh, 250 pounds of air in this particular application, and uh, it's shot with a SCBA bottle that we carry on and our truck. And then that strut just pushes against the sides of the walls and holds them apart? Yep. Uh, depending on the strut, it needs to either be locked by hand or some of them automatically lock. Now, I got another question. You had talked earlier about, we'll talk about the whalers, and, and we're actually looking at, you're testing a prototype whaler that might be used across the country. Yeah, it will be used across the country. This uh, whalers here, these are... Uh, Can we take a look at it? Yep. Now, what exactly is a whaler? Another fancy term. Yeah. What's it mean? All a whaler is, is it enables us to span span a strong back or a piece of plywood. Okay. It gives us a four-foot space if we need to get uh, rope systems in to lower or raise the victim out or equipment in for digging. Now the in. old way of doing it, when we were doing this just not too long ago, was lots of lumber, yeah. lots of lots of lifting, a lot of, lot of manual work to do this. Yeah, our old, our old system, and we still have them uh, today, are 8x8 eight eight, uh, Douglas fir wood. Okay. It takes about four guys to carry them. How, how heavy are the how heavy are the new whalers? Well, the new whalers, uh, 52 lineal feet of the whalers weighs about 500 pounds versus there's they're about half. Okay. Half the weight, an eight, and they come in eight foot, six foot, four foot chunks, so make them manageable for one person. So no more nailing. Uh, yes and no. Okay. Uh, we have to we do need to put some uh, wood into these uh, just because Paratech is they're so new that Paratech hasn't got all the pieces made for it yet. Okay. So. Now, how did you, how did we get picked to, to be one of the sites? Um, all, actually, we're, we, the sales reps stopped by it quite a bit, and we, we got to talking, and we have, we do a, quite a bit of training in USAR, and uh, they like, Paratech likes to have us try stuff out. We take pictures, we send them back. So uh, they're getting real-time feedback getting, on different products. Yep, they're not quite, they are for sale, but. Uh, we are definitely, they're taking our advice and what we like about them and what we don't like about them. Now you were talking about how fast these can cave in. Mm -hmm. What happened on this on this trench that was going to be your practice trench? Well, it still was our practice trench. We just had to tra change our uh, our uh, tack on it. What happened here is this is an, what we call an extra deep trench for us. Anything 10 to 15 feet is extra deep. Mm -hmm. And what happened is, is that about 8 foot we ran into a different type of soil. Looking down at there, sure. you can see the sand. Yep. And the rains that we've had in the past couple of days actually ate, ate away that sand, and actually the whole face of this trench sloughed off about two and a half feet. Okay, and a lot of dirt fell in there. What's dirt weigh? What's a cubic foot of dirt weigh? A cubic foot of dirt weighs about 100 pounds. Okay, so take, how many cubic feet you figure you got dumped there? Oh, I don't know. You got a couple yards there, I suppose. So if someone's under that, they're not going to last very long. No. And no. The, the, a lot of these are going to turn into a essentially body recoveries yeah we uh, if we if we have an incident like this it would probably get switched to a recovery actions quite quickly now a lot of times people are out and they're digging these these holes and they don't realize how fast this can happen and that's what all this training is for then is just for those specific excavations that aren't following the OSHA standards yeah mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't realize that anything your waist or deeper is considered a trench if it is deeper than it is wide it's a problem it's a problem well, this is Truck of the Month, and this Truck of the Month is USAR 8, specially designed to handle all your trench rescue needs. And with us talking about USAR 8 is one of the USAR captains on Station 8, Captain Jason Skibout. And Jason, you've been out doing USAR for quite a while out there, haven't you? Yeah, I've, I was at Station 8 as a firefighter, a driver, and now as a captain for a couple of years. Holy smokes. You bet. <laughs> I like it. retire out of there, uh, too. You never know. <laughs> uh, talking about this truck, what what's the capabilities of this truck, and why do we have it? What's what's the, the background for, for having uh, USAR 8? USAR 8 started about 8 or 10 years ago. Uh, this truck was actually donated to us. Mm -hmm. It carries all of our trench rescue supplies, and it carries some of our structural collapse supplies. So anytime we have a trench rescue, this truck is just automatically rolling? Yes. Okay. Yep. It's an automatic dispatch. It's cross-staffed with firefighters from Rescue 8. So, so Rescue your 8 USAR, will go. The, the, the troops on Rescue 8 just take both trucks, and yes. then they're ready to deploy out anywhere? Yep. 
other rescue trucks in the city will meet us at the scene. Okay, now talk about this truck. What, what do we got in here? I mean, we got a whole bunch of stuff. Did all the stuff that we have out here come out of this truck? Everything you see out around the hole has come out of the truck. Except the whalers. Except, the, for, the, the big except for the new I-beam whalers. Um, those hopefully will be on here someday. You must pack this stuff in pretty tight. It is very crowded. We're actually looking at a new truck with about twice the carrying capability. Oh, that'll be great. The, the cubic space will be about twice as much. So it carries uh, carries all the wood. Does mm -hmm. it also carry all the, because uh, I know we have uh, saws out there, we have hammers, we have nails, we have a lot of hand tools all packed in here? Yes, it carries all our hand tools. It carries all of our Airshore, our Paratech air strut equipment, and it has a Raker Shore kit on it, all built out of aluminum. Uh, it carries some of it carries a generator, a couple chainsaws, our power saws, uh, lots of supplies of nails, hammers, tool pouches, tape measures. Must be when you open the doors, everything must just fly out of this. Thing. Well, it's we try to keep it as organized as possible because it's it's we try be a to high stress environment. Yeah, if something yeah. happens on a on the normal situation most of the truck would be unloaded like you see here and we'd make a tool staging around the truck when we look at looking in the back of this truck it just seems like it just looks like a kind of a junior lumber yard back here yeah there's a little bit of organization here we have our skip shores down in the bottom we have our eight by eight whalers to the left and we've got some miscellaneous two by fours four by fours and two by sixes up above there and we have some more four by sixes down to the right so these crews need to really know when you say I need an 8x8, if I need whatever you want, strong backs, it's not a, well, Captain Skibau, can you tell me what is that thing? It's They just have to know exactly right. what it is and be rolling to get yes. it. Yes. Yep. Some of the most popular questions involve paramedics and ambulances. So we're going to nail out some of those questions. And this first question comes from Ronald. And Ronald lives in Montezuma, Georgia. That sounds like a, a unique place to live, Ronald, but I'm glad you're watching our show. Ronald wants to know, are paramedics part of the fire department, or are they part of a different department? Well, Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, all of our firefighters are basic EMTs. They have to be basic EMTs to have a job at Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. We also have some people that came to our organization and they're paramedics. We have uh, several nurses on the fire department, but the way we operate is they operate in the role of EMTs. So they're not uh, working as paramedics in our department, we, we're going to have another question. We're going to answer that on who provides paramedic service. So, Ronald, there's your question. This question comes from Aaron. Aaron lives in Chicago. Aaron wants to know, are ambulances part of Sioux Falls Fire Rescue? Well, they're not. We have a contracted service, and we're going to talk about that. I'm going to introduce Tim Rave. Tim Rave works for Rural Metro Ambulance. Tim's been on the job for 15 years, and we go back a long way. Uh, we've spent more time together than probably most people want to. And Tim, tell us exactly what's your job with Rural Metro. I'm operations manager here, Jim, and I also am a paramedic. And Tim is? A state representative here in South Dakota. You can't get better guests than on fire call, so that's why we, we got Tim with us. Now tell us, how does this system work with Sioux Falls and Rural Metro? Uh, as you described a little bit before, we are a two-tiered system with basic life support, first response, and advanced which life, fire. which is the fire department community and advanced life support as the second response and transporting units which is rural metro ambulance and this isn't an uncommon thing i know large cities like san diego mm -hmm. have similar arrangements very much so very much so it's not uncommon there is you know every combination of a public utility model to fire service only to private and public together and and any variation thereof and this is Basically, we just have a contract with Rural Metro to provide that service. The city of Sioux Falls has a contract with Rural Metro to, pro to provide advanced life support service to the community. Perfect. Correct. Okay, last question on, on this series, and this one comes from Chris. Chris lives in Des Moines, Iowa, kind of a neighbor, and he, wants, he has a long question, but basically he wants to know, when we have a call here in Sioux Falls, you'll see fire trucks and you'll see ambulance showing up. Chris wants to know, why, does, uh, why do we have all these rigs? Why do we have fire trucks showing up and then we have ambulance showing up? Why not just ambulances? Absolutely. Just like we talked about before, we have a two-tiered system. And so the fire department with more resources is more spread out throughout the community, gets a basic life support EMT, gets that care there quickly. And basically that quick defibrillation for cardiac arrest and CPR. Exactly. exactly. And some oxygen therapy if applicable and et cetera. And then to get the scene stabilized a little bit, and then the transporting or advanced life support service comes in later and, and provides 
either a, a more elevated level of care or if that's not necessary, transport if the situation calls for it. Now when we talk about paramedics and advanced life support, really that boils down to just a, a, a couple of really important things. Could you describe those when we talk about IV therapy and advanced airways? Just real, you know, real basic now. Sure. Time. Um, you know, a couple of the major things, just like you talked about, advanced airways, and that's uh, what we call endotracheal intubation, and that's putting a breathing tube down into the throat to breathe for the patient. You can use a bag to assist them to, to, to breathe, and it really protects the airway. It's kind of the golden airway. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about IV therapy, and, and although that itself is not a, 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 a technically advanced skill, the medications you give through the, the IV line to either stabilize a patient or correct a medical condition are can be quite advanced and so that's that's the level above the basic life support. And is there anything else that we missed? Oh, um, things like pacing. Pacing, although yeah, um, um, cardiac pacing is, is another advanced skill and I'm trying to think of a couple other ones. Um, so those are those require more training, correct. higher level of care and then oversight for those skills. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Well, I hope those answer all your questions, and Tim, I'm just glad you could make it. And Thanks for I'm having sure me we'll on, see each Jim. other again. You bet. Take care. This last question comes from Will, and Will lives in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and he wants to know, where's fire headquarters? Will, it's right here at the corner of 37th and Minnesota. This is a spacious Sioux Falls Fire Rescue Headquarters. Houses not only the fire chief, fire marshal, division chiefs, also houses fire prevention, attached to fire station number three. So this is a nerve center. This is where all the decisions are made. This is where it all happens. Thanks for your question, Will. And we got some shout outs. Now, kind of wrapping down the show, uh, we always try to get a couple of shout outs. Now, some of these shout outs are from several months ago. This first shout out is from Jordan, and Jordan lives in Greenwood, Indiana, and he wants a shout out to the Franklin, Indiana Fire Department. Uh, Jonathan from Holly, New York, wants a shout out to the Holly Volunteer Fire Department in New York, where he's a firefighter. And our last shout out goes to, is from Andrew. Andrew lives in Corona, California, and he wants to give a shout out to the Los Angeles County Fire Department. Uh, if you see uh, Dr. Pratt, Dr. Frank Pratt out there in LA County, he's a medical director, tell him his buddy from Harvard says hi. Well, that was a great show, and, and I tell you what, seeing some of that uh, stuff that the Army provides it was just wild, and I sure liked hanging out with the guys that are doing trench rescue. Your questions are really making the show happen, and if you, uh, if you want to get a T-shirt, you send in a question. Now, these T-shirts look just like this, and they are they're not only sassy, they're kind of swanky, and you just look good in them. you got to send a question in or a shout-out, and if we use it, we'll send you a T-shirt. And we've also had a lot of requests for size t-shirts. And I got some different sizes in, so put down the size you want, and if I can get it, I'll get it, and if not, yeah, just tough luck. Use hot water and shrink it down. I hope you enjoyed the show. I had a great time. My name is Division Chief Jim Sedaris, and you've been watching Fire Call.